Okay, we're going to make a presentation now about the Weapons and the Crash Project. Tom O'Brien, the Big Fight Young. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody. My name again is Tom O'Brien. Uh, the name of my company is the HYM Investment Group. Um, I'm here to talk about the government's proposal. Uh, we are the company combined with a group of investors that are working on the redevelopment of that, of that garage. Um, I've brought with me some of the, the folks who are part of our team, and I just want to make sure that I point them out. Uh, Dino DeFranzo, Dino, who's uh, well known, I think, for many of you, uh, <laughs> is here with us and, uh, uh, and a good friend and, and helping us uh, with uh, neighborhood uh, relationships and, and issues. John Hurley, who's next to him, uh, is part of the HYM uh, staff. Uh, my partner is Doug Manns in the back. Uh, and also, I have two folks from CBT here uh, David and Mitch, if you guys could just wave quickly. Uh, CBT is the architect uh, for, the, uh, for the firm, uh, for the uh, project. So I'm going to talk about the the, uh, uh, the project itself. This presentation takes, uh, please don't time me, but maybe 10 to 15 minutes or so, um, and then I'd be happy to answer as many questions as you might have about the project. Okay? So let me begin. Um, here's the team uh, that's uh, that's part of this. I'm going to try and move around, so I'm not giving everybody, you know, one group my back. So I'll, I'll just try and stay. So sometimes I'll be blocking, sometimes I'll be moving. That's okay. Um, so again, we are HYM, so we're the developer for the project. The investors are part of a company called Bullfinch Congress Holdings. They include a pension fund that's based in Washington, D.C., and a European investment uh, company that has a variety of different investments in the U.S. In addition to that, CBT is our architect. Their offices are, are right over in the Bullfinch Triangle. They're well known and have done a tremendous amount of work in Boston. Uh, our permitting and civil engineering is done by BHB, Traffic and Transportation, Howard Stein Hudson, and a variety of other consultants. This is the point of this slide is to show you that this is a very deep and experienced team. This is a group of people who have done this kind of project before. It's a very complicated project, but we, uh, we have done this before. We've worked together, actually many of us, on different projects before like this. And, uh, and we're looking forward to, to working on this one and, and uh, working it toward completion. Um, here's the schedule that we've been following so far. Uh, we have met, we, we were just sort of uh, half joking, maybe not so half joking, that. Uh, uh, that we have not enjoyed too many dinners at home with family over the last, uh, you know, however many days. But we've been um, working through a variety of group meetings like this. So you can see up there, we did an introduction. There is a, an impact advisory group for this project, which is uh, typically named by the city. Uh, and the impact advisory group is a group of about uh, 10 or 11 people who are part of a group that we sort of present directly to, and those folks are uh, the people who comment directly to us at each of the meetings that we've held, held with them. Um, from this group, it's Dave Roderick, who, uh, who sort of represents uh, the North End Waterfront Residents Association. And, uh, and there are other representatives from the North End. There are people from the West End, people from Beacon Hills. So there's a variety of different uh, organizations that are represented uh, on the IAG. We then, on June 12th, had a, a public meeting with that IAG uh, group. On June the 19th, there was a public meeting, which was advertised by the BRA, which is kind of part of the process. Uh, we met with Beacon Hill Civic Association on the 24th. We then held another uh, IAG meeting on the 26th, West End Civic on the 27th, July 9th, uh, we met with the Civic Design Commission, which is a, an entity that's part of the BRA process that reviews the design of the process. These are, for the most part, architects and others who are involved in their profession. Uh, then another uh, IAG meeting just the other day. Uh, we're here tonight with you folks. We extended, actually, the, the initial 30-day comment period for this project uh, up to July the 12th. I do know that uh, the North End Waterfront Residents Association, this group, has already provided a comment letter. I actually, uh, and Dave and I were, uh, Dave Kubiak, I don't know where Dave went to. Thank Dave you. went back. How can you retreat to the back? That's just, that's not fair, right? I lost See? my seat. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was 10 hours to make our... There we go, exactly. So, uh, so Dave and I emailed each other. Yes, I, I reviewed that comment letter and I prepared for parts of this project, uh, parts of this presentation, as well as during the course of it, to respond to some of your, your comments as well. So I'm going to keep going. Um, here's the site. Um, that's the garage. Uh, I know Victor has told me not to say that the garage is ugly, but I, I there I said it right. So it's um, it's really not one of the prettiest buildings in Boston. Uh, it has been a building that since it was first built in 1970, has been a burden on the downtown. And uh, there have been a variety of people who, for years and years, have looked at the planning for this. In fact, the planning for the demolition and the restructure of this garage uh, has been going on really for probably 25 years or so. 
And, uh, and really what we've tried to do is pick that up and take it to the point where uh, we, we now have a project that can be built, that can really, uh, that can happen. Uh, the project itself is characterized by uh, this large uh, building, obviously. Uh, it is um, on a site that is about 4.8 acres. I'm going to show you that in one second. But there are a couple of things that you just need to note about the garage that are important. The first is, as everybody knows, the garage extends over Congress Street out to the bus station, out to the ramp parcels here uh, that are part of the, the Greenway. Um, the, most of the pieces of the garage <coughs> that are the key to its operation are actually on the west side of the garage. So by that I mean the elevators that take you up to the parking floors are on the west side. Most of the ramp structures are on the west side. Not all of them, but most of them are on the west side. So as a result of that, most of the key pieces that allow the garage to function are here on the west side so they can be kept and used again. Most of the other pieces on the east side, with the exception of the places where you actually park, are sort of superfluous. They're not, they're not central to the focus, of, uh, to the operation of the garage. Um, in addition to that, when the garage was built, and, and some of you may remember this, <coughs> the garage was first built in 1970, it was built as a garage. The office space, the two floors of office space on top, were not part of the garage at the time. Those were uh, built later in 1986. So when it was built as a garage, there is a space all the way down between the concrete slabs of the garage that matches up with these roof elements. So this space exists all the way down. So it is possible for us to put columns through the garage at about this spot where these roof elements are without touching the garage. So we'll sink columns all the way down to ground uh, and build buildings up and through the garage while the garage continues to operate. That's a really important concept. It's not possible for us to just knock the entire garage down for a number of reasons. One, it's an economically operating garage right now. So there's, there's debt on it. There's economics associated with it, number one. Number two, the community depends on the parking around this garage. So it's really not possible to eliminate a 2,300 space garage and have that be gone for a five or six or seven year period of time during the course of, of rebuilding it. So the phasing of it and the phasing of the project is really the only way to make this project work. Um, and that's our that's the premise that we bring to this, this project. So let me uh, begin. So I, I just talked about the 4.8 acres. It's a big site for downtown Boston. Here's what we're trying to get to. So what this slide uh, shows you is, this is a bird's eye view overhead of the completed project with uh, the first floor uses identified. So what we're trying to do is take a garage that is a barrier to pedestrian activity. Very few of us uh, enjoy walking under that garage under Congress Street or walking through the, the, uh, the bus station today. However, once we take the garage all the way back to here and demo the piece that's, demolish the piece that's over Congress Street and out to the bus station, what that allows us to do is to create this wonderful space on the east parcel which will be filled with retail. These pink colored spaces, I'll call them salmon, right, rather than pink. Salmon colored pieces are retail spaces. So these are restaurants, these are stores, these are opportunities for people to eat outside. The blue color, colored spaces are lobbies of office buildings. So there are two, this one here and this one here. And then the, the darker yellow is a hotel um, entry level, entry spot. The yellowish are residential entry uh, lobbies. So pink is all retail, yellow is residential or hotel, blue is office. So all of those pieces go into making a site that is pedestrian friendly, that works for people, that allows, that, that allows people to feel comfortable walking in and out of uh, these retail establishments and makes it a place that is totally transformed from what it is today. It makes it a place that is a connection back and forth across, the, uh, uh, across from downtown to the downtown north or to the Boston Garden area or from the west end to the north end, all those different pieces. And the retail makes it a really nice, lively place for people to want to be. So that's what we're trying to get to. That's the end point that we're trying to get to. Who is the bus station on that? Sure. Bus station remains. I'm going to go through that. But the bus, the bus station is right here. Here's the bus station. So the bus station remains. We rebuild it and reconfigure it. I have a slide for that that I'll, I'll show you. I promise people I do this in 10 minutes. I'm running a little bit long, so I'm going to try and move along faster. Here's, we do this in phases as we, as we move through. The first phase is really to uh, do some work inside the garage. We need to do some uh, relatively small reconfigurations of the ramps and kind of where we are and some improvements around the garage. That's really the first phase. And then the next phase is the building of a residential building. So this is the, the corner that's closest to the police station. This is the police station here. This is the low rise of the, um, of the John F. Uh, Kennedy building. Uh, and this is New Sudbury Street here. 
So this is a residential building. The residential building would come down all the way to grade, and the residential building would have here on the outside of the garage what we call single loaded units. I'm going to show you that in one second, but what that means is when you walk into a typical apartment building, there are units on both sides of the hallway. And that's a double loaded corridor because there are units on both sides. In this corridor, at that level, all the way down um, or surrounding the garage, there will be units only on the left side so that we will be able to cover the garage and begin the process of making that uh, unfortunate structure, I won't say ugly, Victor, unfortunate structure begin to disappear um, from view. So the first building is a residential building. That building is 470 feet tall. Uh, it has um, approximately uh, a little less than 400 units of uh, residential in it. I'm going to go through the unit types in a second. The units will range between studios and three bedrooms. We'll have three bedrooms in this. Uh, that at 478 is about 45, 45 stories. Okay. Apartments. Apartments, yes, yes. The next building is an office building. So this is a building that is uh, built on where the exit drum is today, the rounded drum uh, today. And that building um, would be 600 feet tall. Uh, so that's 48 stories. Office, office floors need to be taller than residential floors, so that's about 48 stories. Um, and that's a building that, again, would begin to reshape the garage and, and, uh, um, and make the garage continue to disappear from view. Then, once we've completed that building, then we would demolish the garage from the greenway back. So here's the ramp parcel, here's the, here's the, um, uh, the bus station here, and we take the garage back. Now, it's important to note that the demolition of the garage is not just, you can't just back up a truck and knock it down. It has to be disassembled. That's the key thing. And when you look at the garage, it's sort of like a, a large Lincoln log. I don't know if you remember the Lincoln logs when we were kids, but the, it's sort of like a large Lincoln log uh, structure. And each of the pieces needs to be disassembled as, as we go through. So that's what's going to happen. We work from the eastern portion back, and we make the garage completely disappear from its overhang over, the, um, over Congress Street, so that for the first time since 1970, that portion of Congress Street would see daylight. Um, which we think is a wonderful uh, community benefit, obviously. And once we've completed that, then we will complete the sort of surrounding of the garage. And this building is a residential building. This building could be either apartments or it could be condos uh, because it's a little smaller, so it could work as, as condominiums. Uh, and that building, again, would have, um, in the lower floors here, would have, flo uh, would have units that would be uh, single-loaded corridors that would ring the garage so that the garage now, at this point, would disappear from view on these three sides, uh, and would be, and the parking would be inside of those three buildings. Okay. How tall is that building? That building is approximately 255. Yep, correct. Yep, 255. How many parking spots do you lose? So I'm going to have, I'm going to go through the parking. It's 2,300 parking spaces today in that garage. The garage today never fills. Um, the average parking in that 2,300 space garage today is about 1,100 spaces. That's about what we do. Even when there's events the garden. Even when there's events of the garden. The other night when the Bruins played in the um, you know Stanley Cup Finals, in that period of time between four o'clock and six o'clock, when you know you still have office parkers and the uh, the Bruins fans are starting to arrive, at most our number goes to about 1,300 spaces total. Charge less, you'll fill it up. What's that? Charge less, and you'll fill it up. Well, the garage is. I'm going to get to this, but the garage is. It's um. It's a, it's a static garage today, unfortunately. And in large part, the people who park in that garage are contract, contract parkers. So we have Mass General uh, parks in there. We have uh, contracts with other major employees. The federal government is still a big parker in that garage, uh, very big. Um, so for the most part, it doesn't fill up from daily parkers. And we need to keep the contract parkers going. So you'll see when we, when we change this, when we make this work, the contract parkers, for the most part, will go out. So the federal government will park at a, you know another garage. Perhaps they'll park in the garage in front of the, the Boston Garden or you know some other spot. The um, in Mass General, same thing. Perhaps they'll park in, in that. But we can still accommodate all of the uses that are sort of neighborhood or transit parkers today. So, for example, we have about 500 parkers, uh, 500 night parkers. <coughs> our, our night deal. Some of you may have this. Our night deal is. I believe it's $100 a month, right? 110 per month. $110 per month. Oh, I didn't know you were here. Nice to see you. Um, about $110 a month, um, and you have to get in at 4, you can't get in before 4.30, you have to leave at 9.30 in the morning. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. Now Nancy tells me it's 120. That's just park. That guy runs like a garage right there. <laughs> <laughs> He's uh, so if Nancy's getting charged 125, we're going right. to charge Nancy. I want my money back. <laughs> <laughs> so the um, um, so can I just finish this one point? So those 500 cars, those are a mix of North End people, Beacon Hill, you know, West End people. Those 500 cars we can accommodate in this completed project. So and I'll go through that in a slide. What about the Boston Police cars? That run the whole stretch. Yeah. I'm gonna go through that. Okay. So, but but basically, we're gonna work to relocate those those police cars into the garage. Right. In the end, how many parking? I, I I do hard stuff for a little bit. In the end, how many parking spaces? So there's there will be in the end about 1,100 parking spaces in the garage. So it's down by, what do you think is excess now? Yeah. Although, the, can I get to that slide? Would you mind when I when I get there? Let me just keep going, and I, and you'll see it visually how it how it works. How many were there? 2,300 today, but they don't, they're, they're never used. There's a thousand at least per day that are unused. That's the, that's the key. So once we've, we've done that and fully closed the garage, then we, on the east parcel, uh, build, this is a, a small office building here, approximately 120 feet tall or so here. This is a small retail building. This is a hotel, about 200 uh, rooms. And this is a, a small residential building, about 100 units. This probably is a, a condo building um, associated with the hotel. Um, and that's where we get to, obviously, that east parcel that I described before with the retail, very active, making a connector, um, where today the hotel is, is a barrier. So that's the, the phasing of it. Here's uh, one of the questions, and, and this is where, Dave, I'm gonna kind of mingle in some of the responses to the, you know, to, uh, the comment letter that, that uh, Newer had given me. Um, one of the questions that, uh, that people had raised is, Sort of what's the mechanism, what's, what's your process that you, you plan to go through? Um, and uh, what, we're, we're, what we're in right now is we filed a project notification form about the project, okay? And that, uh, that project notification form bears now, I think, a 35-day comment period, which ends on Friday of this week. Um, so uh, as we complete that, our effort then will be to respond to those comments in the form of a DPIR, uh, a draft project impact report, which we'll file uh, uh, you know, hopefully by the end of July, some, somewhere in there. As part of that draft project impact report, we plan to also file um, a request with the VRA to uh, create what's called a plan development area, uh, PDA it's called, which essentially allows there to be zoning created for uh, this project. Along with the PDA, there will be what we call a development plan document. And the development plan document will describe exactly what will happen and, and when. So that will be sort of the roadmap for, for how things move forward. We're doing that basically looking at the zoning map today. So this is the existing zoning map for the area. And um, it's hard for you to read in the back what the, uh, what the, the key says here on the right. But, but essentially, this is the, uh, the, the kind of the government center uh, district, OK? Everything but the federal building. Obviously, the city being a lesser sovereign than the federal government can't really zone with where is the federal government. This area, which includes the courthouse, the Brook Courthouse, as well as it looks like kind of the courtyard of the, of the Lindemann Center, uh, is an area that, with these blue dots, in which PDAs are allowed. So essentially what we're going to suggest is, and this happens quite frequently, is that that map could be amended to allow a PDA here for this project. And therefore, we would then file the PDA and have a PDA be allowed for the project. That's our, that's our basic plan for the process. I hope that answers the question. I'm sure you might have more on that as I, as I keep going. Um, here are, there are four basic principles that we're trying to bring to this project. The first of these is to undo urban renewal. Undo, I know, is not really a word, but, I, but it uh, seems to fit in this one. So to undo urban renewal. Uh, we then wanted to try to create a, a transformative vision for the site, which is a key thing. We want to be good environmental stu stewards. And we want to create great public spaces and great architecture as, as we move forward. So these are our four basic principles as we move along. So the first of these is to undo urban renewal. This building you can see is just plain wrong. I, again, I apologize, Victor, but it's wrong. Wrong for Congress Street, it's wrong for the site. It needs to be corrected. So, um, uh, and as you see the, the various vistas, um, it really is a barrier um, from a pedestrian standpoint and uh, from a visual standpoint. So it really does need to be corrected. In addition to that, though, the building itself, when created, was created for cars, really, for the most part. So there are major pedestrian safety pro uh, problems at all of the surrounding intersections um, for, the, for the garage. And so part of the opportunity here is to uh, transform the project, change it to something that works, but also make it uh, a more pedestrian-friendly uh, place as well. Historically, many of you, you know, already know this story, so I won't dwell too much on it, but historically, 
the bullfinch triangle came through. There was a there was a sort of a, a, a pinnacle of the bullfinch triangle that ran through historic uh, Haymarket Square, and the, the kind of the view corridor was the old state house uh, here. And then of course that was interrupted with the creation of the artery in 1957. Um, and really what we've been about since, even after urban renewal, is correcting those mistakes from the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, and many of you have, have lived through those burdens and Nancy and others have helped lead us all through, uh, through all those pieces. And so really the story of what's been happening now has been kind of restoring the connectivity through these projects that have started to happen so far and restoring a sense of balance to the Bullfinch Triangle. It, it now can be a place where people can both live and work. Um, and the last big project, frankly, to make that work is the garage. This is the last big barrier. Um, and so we feel like we're contributing to a process that has started long ago and started to, to transform this area in a way that uh, removes that last barrier. So as we try and re-knit the neighborhood fabric, here are the, here's the, the considerations. So here at the ground plane is what the garage looks like today. Those two yellow pieces are the existing retail spots in the garage. Uh, so there was a, a Kaplan uh, uh, standardized test review uh, uh, spot in here. There's a Dunkin' Donuts in here. And then there's kind of a Store 24 uh, place in there as well. Uh, we've been on this project for three years. And we've tried as hard as we possibly could to get this retail space leased. We've tried sandwich shops. We've tried exercise places. We've tried rental car. We can't get those. Um, there's nobody who wants to be in that space as a retailer. And, uh, and so that whole area just doesn't work for pedestrians or retailers. It's not a friendly place, obviously, and I think we all know that. So our objective in re the neighborhood fabric is to take first that big, ugly garage and see if we can work it back to the western side of the parcel uh, here uh, and use that as our, you know, as our, our, our piece for parking remaining, but, uh, but push it back to the western side. Then begin to surround that garage, as I described, with uses that at the ground plan work well for people. Retail, entrance lobbies for uh, residential buildings, entrance lobbies for uh, an office building. In addition to that, when we look at the east parcel, one of the key things that we want to make sure happens is we want to make sure that there's a great connection here at Canal Street. And as you can see, the bus station today is deep and relatively short in terms of how, it, uh, how the bus run works. And so one of our objectives is to make the bus uh, station have the same capacity but to shrink it um, in terms of the number of lanes, there are six lanes today in that spot. We'd shrink that to four lanes, but we'd lengthen the lanes so that, uh, so that it could uh, uh, provide the same service. And what that allows us to do is to make this great pedestrian connection down Canal Street uh, and either toward uh, Congress Street or toward the, uh, uh, toward the North End Parks, which we, uh, that's the, one of the key objectives of the entire project. So in doing that, what you want to do is, is shape the, that walkway on either side with great retail. So that's what that east parcel is all about, with great places for people to eat outside, restaurants, uh, uh, I would say retail that is, uh, that is unique and interesting and sort of of the Bullfinch Triangle and of the North End and of the West End. Um, not necessarily national change, but really unique and interesting uh, retail. Um, then that also allows us to focus on these intersections. This intersection at Merrimack Street New Chardon and Congress is probably one of the worst intersections for pedestrians in the city. It's probably actually one of the worst intersections uh, uh, for cars as well. In fact, there was a uh, there was a, an accident here uh, just uh, two mornings ago in which a, a bicyclist was hit. Uh, I'm not sure if the bicycle, uh, how the bicyclist is doing, but it's it's a very dangerous place. So making improvements to that intersection um, uh, is a key function of ours, and all these intersections intersections and making them work uh, much more effectively for, for pedestrians is the is the key thing. In addition to that, what we can also do then is create buildings, and our objective has been to create slender buildings with roofs on them that are, that are green roofs. And so if you just compare these buildings as an example to the other surrounding buildings that exist, so you know, here's the courthouse, here's the, the project uh, One Canal, which will begin uh, the next uh, 60 days or so, you can see these are characterized by very large floor plates, very, very large projects. And what we've tried to do is these buildings I know that people will ask me um, about the, the building's heights, but the buildings themselves are very slender. Um, and you can see that by uh, how they compare to the, the existing floor plates of these other buildings uh, nearby. Um, and all of the roofs, we've endeavored to create sort of green spaces on top for, um, uh, for people. So that allows us to create this transformative public realm. So these are symbols that describe restaurants uh, and places for people to shop or lobbies where people can make their way in. And that leads us to this transformative vision that we've tried to make. And as we bring the transformative vision, what we, we want to do is reshape the massing of the current building, which is 
uh, not really correct for the site. Again, pushing the garage back to the, uh, to the west uh, portion of the parcel, beginning the process of trying to surround that garage with appropriate uses so that it begins to disappear from view, um, working to create that really great uh, pedestrian connection between Canal Street here out to Congress Street and to the North End Parks. Um, and then in addition to that, because this, um, these blocks are uh, the Blackstone blocks and, um, uh, and really, I think, have a, a particular height associated with them, we push down the heights of those buildings that are immediately closest to the, the Blackstone blocks. Uh, we are following the, the BRA guidelines in terms of the height for that, uh, for these parcels. The BRA approximately two years ago uh, published guidelines for the Greenway that included uh, heights for this. I'll, I'll go through that in one second, but heights for the western side of the parcel. So that's where these two buildings come from, the residential building here and the office building here. And then in addition to that, we've worked through what we think is an appropriate gesture for this part of Congress Street, that there be sort of uh, twin buildings, uh, and that these buildings are the two residential buildings for that portion of Congress Street to sort of uh, announce the fact that this is an important project and an important site at that, at that spot. Um, these are the unit typologies. So I, I talked about the concept of the single loaded corridor. So these, these are units that um, are built to uh, wrap the garage, basically, and make the garage disappear from view. And in that uh, residential building on the uh, southwest corner, uh, we would have three bedroom units uh, as well, which is uh, something that we think is uh, a really important business element, but it's also something we think that's important to neighborhoods as well. So here's what the project begins to look like in its, uh, in its completion, uh, and, uh, and we're very excited about the, the, uh, the potential for it. These are the Greenway District Guidelines. So these were published by the BRA approximately two years ago. So I, I, I point these out to make sure that people understand that we're, we're following a, a process that has been underway for a long period of time. In fact, I would say, as I said at the outset, the planning for this, this parcel has been ongoing for probably 25 years. And there has been very specific planning going on in this parcel probably since 2006 at least. So there's, we're building upon years and years of thought around what should be appropriate for how we correct this uh, garage and correct this situation. Um, here's a, a, a slide that shows you what this looks like as an addition to the uh, skyline. So here's, here's the approximate site of the, of the project today, and here's what it would look like with the, the buildings on it as well so that people can have a sense of that. Um, we want to try and create great public spaces and architecture. I'm going to try and pick up the pace a little bit if I can. The architectural language, each of these buildings will be subject to our large project review and we'll be working through very special and particular architectural language for each building. We want to try and unlock these urban vistas that, uh, that have been blocked since 1970. So here you're standing on the corner of Merrimack Street looking back toward, uh, uh, toward uh, the Parcel 7 garage. Uh, and obviously when the garage comes down, there's a view of the Custom House Tower, which today people cannot see. Um, this is the, the view from New Sudbury Street. There's very little activation. It's not very pedestrian friendly here on the garage. And yet after uh, with, uh, retail here and, uh, and kind of eyes on the street with these units makes it a very different place. Um, we also have uh, tried to, to look at uh, what this would feel like from the north end. So what we've done is we've created renderings from uh, uh, a few corners of the north end to give people a sense of what these buildings would look like from the north end. I've also included, by the way, views from the west end and, um, and from Beacon Hill as well. So I'll include those as well. So here's... Um, uh, Snow Hill Street near uh, DiFilippo uh, Playground. Here's currently, so here's you know before, here's, here's what it is today looking back um, at the garage site which is over here and here's what it would look like with the completed project um, here. Um, here's the Hanover Street, the intersection of Hanover Street and Fleet Street. Um, again, looking across here uh, today and then looking afterwards you're actually, you're actually blocked and, and really can't see the buildings at, at that point. That's sort of I don't have to tell you folks, it's kind of the character of the North End, which, which you know, is, is pretty tight streets and, uh, uh, and buildings already. So the, the view to these buildings would be, uh, it would be hard to see these buildings from many spots in the, in the North End. Um, here's the view from the North End Park. Uh, this is a rendering that we, we created. This is actually the cover of our, our, our book uh, that we've created. And uh, so this is the view from the North End Park um, as well. Um, I've included, as I said, views from the West End and from the Beacon Hill. Area. So here's uh, coming up Cambridge Street near, near Old West Church today, uh, and then here's where it would look like tomorrow. Here's the here's the building here, just uh, up over these these trees here. Um, here's the the view from uh, the corner of Cambridge Street and Temple Street. Uh, again, looking you're you're here in Cambridge, right near kind of where the uh, the Store 24 is, looking back at the, the JFK building, 
and here's what it would look like with the completed project here, the office building and the residential building at the top of, of Cambridge Street. Here's the view in the west end um, in the, the road path. Um, so here's what it is today. You really can't see very much of it. And then afterwards, again, it's, 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 it, it can't be seen at the, at the pedestrian level very, uh, very well. Um, and then we, I think we did one more. This is Martha Road near the West End Park. So here's the, um, uh, here's the garden garage uh, here. Here's the Tip O'Neill building here. Uh, and here's the view looking down Martha Road uh, here at the, uh, uh, at the office building. Again, um, you know, I think a, a relatively, uh, not, not, a, not a huge impact, I think, on the, on the, on the road itself. Um, here's the East Parcel Plaza. You know, here's some ideas around what the East Parcel Plaza can begin to look like. I don't, I really don't need to dwell on this just because there'll be a lot of design work, but really what we're after on that East Parcel Plaza is to take it from what it is today that everybody recognizes and begin to change it to something like this. So this is that retail plaza. We think it can be something really special. Here's what it begins to look like at night as well. Um, a very uh, nice, active, friendly place for people to, uh, to want to be. In our project notification form, there are a number of topics that we covered. Um, uh, if people do not have a copy of that, we can make sure that they have one. It's available on our website. Um, and there's, a, uh, there's one as well on the VRA website. Our website is redevelopmentofgovernmentcentergarage.com. Did I get that right? Government Center Garage Redevelopment. I'm sorry, Government Center Garage Redevelopment.com. I apologize for that. So it's available on our website, but also you can see John or Doug or myself afterwards at Dino, and we'll make sure that you, that you get one. Uh, we have to, have to do that for you. Um, I think we're going to try and just run through quickly a little bit on this. Transportation and parking, we've had uh, some of this discussion already, so let me just talk about it. Part of the reason why I think the VRA published the, the Greenway guidelines in the way that they did, and certainly the reason that we've proposed the buildings in the way that we have, is because this is a site where uh, density like this is appropriate. Um, this is a site that after years and years of all the public expenditures, this is uh, the site where there's the confluence of a tremendous amount of transportation infrastructure. So as everybody knows, these are the ramp parcels for direct access into 93, um, both on and off of 93. Uh, there's a Green Line station here, obviously. There's an Orange Line station here uh, at Haymarket. So there's a tremendous amount of transportation infrastructure that's already been built. And, and that's really why this site, this area, we think is ripe for redevelopment. That's why we think it works. In addition to that, there are already car and bike share locations on the, on the site. Um, and in fact, we have a zip car uh, location on our site. I think we, in addition to having just cars, we have zip vans as well, which is one of the unique uh, spots that we have. Uh, and then we have an enterprise rental car, which is used quite a bit. Uh, so there are already are existing spots. There's also hubway uh, spots nearby. And as part of uh, what we will do, we'll make bicycling improvements and amenities. We'll create um, one of the biggest uh, bike storage facilities in the city, about eight, room for about 850 bikes, um, which, uh, which we're excited about. And obviously keep the zip car and create bike lanes and biking opportunities for people all nearby. The traffic access and circulation plan, this is a very important thing for, for people to know. So as part of uh, fixing this intersection of Bouchard Street and Merrimack Street, we're going to take this garage entrance, which today is really not well conceived at all, and take the garage entrance and exit uh, and, and move it around here to Bowker Street. Um, so we'll, we'll make that, um, that entrance and exit um, here on Bowker Street. We'll keep the same exit that exists today on New Sudbury Street and the same entrance on New Sudbury Street. We'll keep those pieces in place um, so the, the garage will still be serviced from that side. But by changing that, we're totally reshaping the Chardon Street as much more pedestrian friendly. It gives us a chance to make this intersection work much more effectively for pedestrians. So we're excited about that. Um, in addition to that, you can see here, uh, these are spots for people to enter as pedestrians. So these, uh, these darker triangles are uh, pedestrian entrances into residential buildings. Uh, the sort of clear triangles are pedestrian entrances into retail spots. Obviously, what we're trying to show in this slide is the way to transform a spot like this is to have numerous door knobs, numerous places for people to go in. And that's what changes it. It makes it much more pedestrian friendly. It makes it a much more interesting place than it is today, just a, a big, huge garage. Um, vehicular trip uh, distribution and entering. So the, um, um, because of the presence of the ramps here, right in front of the garage, um, the, the vast majority of the car trips to this site will go on and off the 93 ramps. So this site really works well for this kind of development in large part because um, the cars, I, love, I don't know if there's a play or something going by, but um, 
They sound like they're very good. Very good dramatic acting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, so with many other projects that might be proposed in downtown Boston, what you have is the cars would come off a ramp and then search around city streets to get to the project itself. But for us, the cars coming off the ramp are going right into the garage, which we're excited about. And cars coming out of the uh, the project again will go right into the ramp. So the impact on city streets is actually um, uh, very uh, very small in comparison to the project itself. So this slide shows percentages of, of cars, for example, uh, that would uh, impact city streets. Uh, and you know, on Cambridge Street, I can tell you off the, the top of my head as we do the math, uh, the total additional treat, uh, uh, trips on Cambridge Street, just because I have that in my mind from doing this in Beacon Hill the other night, was uh, 40. So four zero total additional trips on Cambridge Street from this project. So, so very few additional trips on city streets. Uh, a lot of what people will do will go in and off the, uh, the 93 uh, ramps. Same is true, obviously, going home. So the, the blue is uh, for people who are exiting the, the building at the end of their, uh, their work day. Here's the, the bus station. So today, here's what the bus station is. And as I said, it's, it's deep, but not very long. Um, and what, it gives, what the redevelopment gives us the chance to do is organize the bus station more effectively, offer more length for the buses to drop off, uh, and make improvements for people, the bus station would continue to be covered. So this building that we would build here would cover the bus station so that uh, pedestrians waiting for a bus would continue to, to wait under cover. Uh, in addition to that, this gives us the chance to make improvements. Today, when you take a bus from this station, you must uh, buy a Charlie car down below at Haymarket Station uh, or buy your, your or pay your fare to the bus driver. Uh, we can put Charlie car machines right up here. We can make the bus station work more effectively for T personnel. We've spent a ton of time, as everybody knows, uh, Dino knows his way around the MBTA very, very well. we spent a ton of time with MBTA operations staff, both the bus uh, staff, as well as the um, uh, train staff, the Haymarket train staff, and the variety of other professionals who are at the MBTA to work through this, and they've been very satisfied with what we're, we've been working on so far. And so we're feeling very good about the direction we're taking with the MBTA. So essentially what this does is it organizes the bus station more effectively, and more importantly, it allows us to create this great pedestrian plaza here by moving the bus station, as you can see, over just slightly by two lanes. So a big public benefit as a result. Shadow studies. So a lot of people have asked about shadow studies, so we want to make sure that we included that um, as well tonight. So the first of these is, this is spring and fall equinox, so this is March 21st or September 21st, I guess it will be, right? Um, so these are spring and fall equinox. As, you, as folks know, obviously, the, the sun will come up over here and come uh, this way sort of you know, on, uh, to the south of this project and, and work its way over that way. Um, so this is 9 a.m. on spring and fall equinox. What are the colors? Um, I'm going to tell you that. So the colors are uh, the, the blue, the darker blue is new shadow on street level or on public spaces, okay? The light blue is new shadow on the roofs of buildings. And then dark blue, and I'll try and differentiate, there's some that are dark blue where there's new shadow, not on a public space, nor on a street, but sort of on the, on the face of a building. You know what I mean? So that, that actually applies quite a bit in the North End. Um, so here's uh, 9 a.m. On, on March 21st. Um, obviously, most of the shadow, as you can see, falls off Merrimack Street <coughs> down this way. There's actually um, uh, a little, uh, shadow on the roofs of the buildings, but there's, um, uh, you know, the, the, most of the new shadow is on Merrimack Street itself. Uh, here's 12 noon on that same day, March 21st. Again, most of the shadow you can see is on Merrimack Street um, across the way. Some falls on the roofs of, of these buildings. And then here's uh, 3 p.m. on March 21st. Um, most of the shadow falls on New Chardon Street uh, here and across the way, and some on the roofs of these buildings in the North End, um, and some on, I thought that's Hanover Street, or uh, no, that's not Hanover. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, and some here on, uh, on that spot as well. Um, here's December 21st, so these obviously are the longest shadows. Here's winter solstice, solstice sorry. Um, so here, the new shadow, so obviously in the winter solstice, there's quite a bit of shadow that already exists. So what we're charged with tracking is where will there be new shadow created by our project. And the new shadow here, again, uh, runs along Merrimack Street uh, here uh, through the Bullfinch Triangle. Um, and then at noon time, uh, the shadow, the new shadow is, is actually, you know, very, not very much new shadow. There's, there's some on the roofs of these buildings. And then uh, later in the day at 3 o'clock, that shadow, for the most part, these, these blue pieces into here 
are that shadow on the on the face of a building. That's not sh new shadow on the street. The, the streets of the North End at 3 o'clock on December 21st, as most of you know, are already in shadow. And so those are uh, shadows on the, on the face of a building. Uh, this is blue shadow on Boston Harbor. This is about where the, uh, the Coast Guard facility is um, today. Um, then uh, this is June 21st. This is summer uh, solstice. So here's 9 a.m. Uh, the shadow, for the most part, falls on New Chardon Street, uh, a portion on the courthouse, and on the, um, the courtyard of the Liniment, Center, or Liniment Building. Uh, this is uh, noontime. Obviously, the sun's fairly high in the sky. It falls, for the most part, on the intersection of New Chardon and Merrimack Street. Uh, here's 3 p.m. on June 21st. Uh, this is shadow that falls, for the most part, on the project itself, um, on New Chardon and on uh, New Sudbury Street. And then we, sh we wanted to make sure that you sh we, sh we showed you 5 p.m. on June 21st. And there is shadow here that falls on the, the North End Park. Now, this shadow obviously is moving at this point. People need to understand that this isn't a permanent uh, thing. The shadow moves through you know, on a fairly steady basis as we move toward sundown as well. Just quickly, green building sustainability, we embrace this as a really important part of what it is where uh, we're working on the project sustainability framework. We're going to make a positive contribution to the community, create a mobility hub. We're going to make the buildings energy efficient, resource efficient, able to cope. This is, I don't want to spend too much time on this for the purpose of this presentation. But this is a huge theme of what we're embracing. This is a, a really rare opportunity to take a huge project that is really about cars and change it into something that is um, uh, that contributes quite a bit to the sustainability of the, of the project. So a you know, positive contribution to the community creating a mobility hub, obviously it's really logical by creating hubway stations, make, taking advantage of the T, making sure that all the buildings are energy efficient by focusing on, focusing on the envelope design of the buildings themselves, and a variety of other pieces, using resources efficiently. Doing this work that we're doing in the garage saves a tremendous amount of fuel in the way that we do it. I don't want to, again, spend uh, too much time on that, but it's uh, uh, using resources efficiently is a, is a huge part of the win here. We can design new buildings that can also use resources more efficiently as well. Um, we're able to cope with future climate change by doing certain things with the green roofs, uh, by locating uh, the buildings in a certain way, designing the buildings in a certain way, creating ventilation opportunities for the, uh, for the buildings in a certain way, um, and you know, obviously uh, taking care to, to make sure that we do things that were uh, not thought of in, the, in years past, making sure that the, the windows are operable, for example, and other pieces to allow people to lessen energy use. Um, we can make it sustainable in the operation. You know, one uh, example is uh, all of the, the residential units here will be responsible for paying for their own water and, uh, and energy usage. If you pay for it, you use less of it. Um, so we'll you know, submeter for water and all those, all those different pieces. And the buildings themselves will be, the office buildings will be lead gold, and the residential buildings will be lead silver. And here's what the project begins to look like in its entirety. And here's the public realm plan. I think that's the so I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. Let's stop with questions. Um, yeah. So I think the switch. Um, there are 771 residential units in the uh, in the project. Um, so there's a mix of of studios, ones and twos and threes. So. 1,400. Yeah, approximately, probably. 1,400 or 1,500 total residents. Well, I think there's, I mean, all the work that everybody's done to create all the open space for the parks and all those different so pieces. There's, excuse me. What does it total to all that open space? You know, I don't have that calculation, but there, there would be, there's, there's quite a bit of open space that's already been created nearby, I guess is what I'm saying. That's an offensive. Um, I, you know, I'll have to get back here and look at the calculations. I, I, I don't know the answer. Yeah. Yes, sir? I, I'd like to make a comment about the public transportation. Uh, I take the orange line every morning at various times between 7.30 and 9.30 in the morning. And at the Haymarket Station, which is right next door. Um, there are many times when that's coming in from the, from the north. Uh, on the orange line, where I have to wait two or three cars before I can even get on, mm. even with people getting on. Mm. Mm. Now, 
Uh, I would like to see, with all of the new office space and residential pieces that are going in, how many you expect people you expect to give up their cars and come in on the public transportation? Because it's a very serious issue already. Mm. And unless we get a, a, a government commitment to solve this problem before you increase the problem, there's going to be a lot of friction. Yeah, I mean, I'd, um, I'd be the first to say that you know that the work that's happening up at the state house right now to fully fund the MBTA is is important work that we all should support. There's a lot of us um, here who depend on the MBTA, and uh, and it hasn't been fully funded in decades probably. So I, I would say I, I agree with you on that. Um, uh, for us, we've spent a ton of time with the MBTA. Uh, Dino and I just uh, two days ago were again with the the operation staff of the MBTA. They actually said to us, they recognize at the Orange Line today uh, that for people in the, in the peak rush hour, there are uh, times when people have, have to wait for a second or perhaps a third train you know, to, uh, to, to board it. Um, and so they recognize that. I think they, they feel like they'd like to add more cars to the Orange Line, but a lot of that is dependent on what happens in the legislature as well. I, I guess our point is there has been tremendous, already, tremendous money already spent on the Orange Line. There's more money that's going to be spent on the Green Line. And, uh, and so that infrastructure exists, and additional operating funds will be helpful to make that to make that all work. I, I agree with you. There needs to be full funding for the team. Sir, couple of questions. Um, how much taller is the high-rise office building in the JFK? Uh, the JFK building, I think, is 450 feet tall. Yeah. Four stories. Yeah. So, uh, so our building is about 150 feet taller than the JFK. And my second question, and it doesn't concern you a little bit, what's the proposal for not station air forces to come in and use that down there? Yeah, I, see, I don't, I'm not the guy for that. It's a ballpark idea. I, I, I'd, be, I, I'd be wrong to, I, I don't want to be wrong, you know, so I, I, can't, I can't say what they're going to someone who was born here, and I work in the JFK, well, this is very ambitious, and it's, very, it's a challenge, I have to say. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's garage. I'll say it. It's ugly. It's been ugly since 1970 when I started to well, okay. I want to be here. I want to be five marks see half of it come back. Well, we, we want to be the guys that do it, that's for sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Within the next two months, we'll have a presentation on the Boston Garden Project also. Oh, well, okay. yes. Because that's, well, my question really is around the density of it. I mean, she was asked about the number of apartments. Now, when we coupled that with our station board, and, and we're here in the North End, we know how many apartments we have here. This is going to be like almost double the size of the North End. It's only about two blocks away. So. Yeah, no, it's not almost double. I mean, the North End, uh, I, I can't say offhand, but there are many thousands of units. In the North End. This is only 771, so it's not, it's not double. Yes, sir? You're going to put in 771 living units. You're going to put in a hotel. Yes. You're going to have retail establishments. You're going to have um, restaurants. Yes. Not everybody's going to get there by walking or taking the team. There's going to be a tremendous amount of people driving. Now, with your garage is already using 1,100 parking spaces every day, and you're reducing it down to 1,100 parking spaces. Are you telling me that the office space, the office uh, the tenants are not going to have priority on those spaces, or the hotel's not going to have priority on those spaces, and the tenants are not going to have priority on those spaces, so the people that are parking there now are going to be, not be thrown out? So let me, let me run through this. Okay. The, um, today, the 1,100 or so parking uh, parkers in the, in the garage during the course of the day obviously are all office workers and they're contract parkers. Okay. In the future, what happens with this garage is, as it's 1,100 spaces, it's a series of mixed uses around it. So you have residences who, for the most part, will use it at night. Most, a lot of the people who will live here will work on 128, or maybe they won't own a car. I'm, I'm, just, for a reason. I'm, I'm just telling you, because we, we build these buildings, and I'm just telling you, the people today who rent in these apartment buildings, okay, for the most part, do not want to work on It's expensive, it's hard for them to operate it, they have to insure it, all the rest of it. So um, the planning staff, the BRA, and we agree with them, have identified the possibility that there will be less than 0.5 spaces per unit that are needed for the residential units in this project. That's that's the that's really it's very accepted, very well accepted among transportation planners in the lake. Now, I don't I don't doubt I don't doubt that it's hard to find a street parking place in the North End. I'm, I'm not I'm not suggesting that it's not. Nor am I nor am I saying that it's not expensive to park in the North End. I'm not that's I'm not doubting that. But what I'm saying to you is when you build these new residential units, um, the formula 
is less than 0.5 spaces per unit in terms of the kinds of spaces that you need. Let me just finish that point real quick. So and then what that means is the garage becomes a dynamic garage rather than a static garage. So you have residential people who might park during the course of the day. They take the car out during, um, you know, during the uh, course of the night. I'm sorry, take the car out during the day. Office parkers come in uh, during the course of the day, and the formula for office parkers is 0.75, I think it is, per thousand square feet. 0.3. Point, I'm sorry. 0.3 point, point three, uh, spaces per thousand square feet for office parkers um, as well. So when we go through the math, we can absolutely park all of the uses that we're proposing. Hotel even more so. Hotel is maybe just 0.25 spaces per per hotel room. I mean, think about that hotel. Most for the most part, the people who are going to stay in that hotel are flying to Logan. The business people are, you know, whatever, right? So um, at the end of the day, we have. I don't want to make you go read this. Believe me, it's it's like it'll put you to sleep at night. But we have a very extensive transportation study that is part of our project notification form. If you only want to read the executive summary of that, um, it's worthwhile reading. It. Because um, what you'll see is we can absolutely park all of the uses that we're proposing, and we can still park the 500 or so parkers at night, North End, West End, uh, Beacon Hill, who park in the garage. Because obviously the office workers have gone home and we'll have them. Uh, but I thought you said that you, you have, are you saying that the 1,100 people that use it includes the 500 at night, so it's only yes. 600 during the day? Yeah, because what happens okay. is the contract parkers, the federal, the federal workers come in during the day, no, and MGH workers come in during the day. Um, and other office workers come in during the day, and then they all leave. The garage is empty pretty much at night. No, no, I so 500 people come in, and, and so we can accommodate that again. Unless there's a game. Unless there's a game. But even then, there's plenty of room. I mean, I don't know if you park there on an every game, it's, but you know, as I told you, the most we get, the most we get just in that two hour spillover period, there's 1,300 spaces. The most we get for that. Monica? Yes, I have a question about the MBTA station at Haymarket. Will that be fully operational all through the construction? I assume that you'll be doing a lot of blasting and digging. No blasting. Will that, or whatever, digging maybe, will that impact the uh, service of the key or the, uh, the station right there? I, I, will it be close to times or will the... Uh, I think that, so remember the, uh, the way the T station works today, this is the head house for this end of the Haymarket station, right? And then there are uh, opportunities to get into Haymarket station here at the parcel seven garage, as, as you well know. So I, I, we certainly believe that as you demolish this garage and you work to try and take that back, that there will be periods when this part of the head house, this head house, this part of Haymarket will not be accessible to pedestrians. Absolutely. But it won't influence the running of the T. I mean, the T well, is well, the still going to run. We, we cannot stop yeah. the T. No way, uh, that's going to have to run. But the uh, but there will be pe places for people to go in here to get to Haymarket. The buses, in addition to that, to rework this, we're going to have to have a temporary relocation spot for the buses. Now, Haymarket, the definition of Haymarket for the bus stoppage is actually pretty broad. There are a variety of stops around the neighborhood that are still called Haymarket Square. So we're working with the T to work on that now to lessen the burden. Get, getting rid of a 40-year-old burden, this big, huge garage, is not going to be easy. It's going to be complicated. But um, we think we can do it, and uh, we're going to work with the team to make sure it works well. Nancy? We talked about the surface underground. We have our sewers and so forth. Have you given a thought? We're going to have how many more thousands of people here using the same old sewers, the same old water pipes, the same old everything? Will it be able to sustain the additional pressure on them? Yeah, I just I just read today the comment letter from the Boston Water and Sewer Commission, and they they believe that there's enough capacity, certainly in the system, to, to deal with this project. I mean, the way those those entities think about mass water and all those folks, the way they think about this is they think about decades of, of growth um, to, to look ahead. Plus, you'll remember too when the big dig was was built. Um, you know, there, before the big dig, there was a hodgepodge of pipes and underground. And one of the first, pro one of the first mega projects, or kind of subtext of the of the big dig, was to relocate all those pieces. So there are, there's actually new pipe and new electrical conduit. Well, um, we had problems with them recently. We we had a lot of land in the street. Mm -hmm. Conduit getting stolen. And star. Right, and the water, you know, I'd love to give you a number for end star. We we don't always have an easy time with end star ourselves. I, I agree with you on that, but it, it's um, okay. The, the question though is really, what's the point of the building? Because you're going to have to build a new sewer system. Thousands of people flushing, using water, using electricity, 
using all the utilities that you need. Is there, uh, shall we say, a, a line where you cannot cross before everything goes up? Do you have that study? Yes, I mean, we've done extensive water, so again, in the project, I don't want to make you read this, because it's again, you know, but the, the water study and all those different pieces are all in the project notification form. I'm not the expert on the, the water and the sewer and electrical, you know, so, so I'd have to refer that to somebody from the gas lines and all those things. But, but certainly there's enough capacity, I and mean, the city has to, we, you know, as you know, we spent, you know, $15 billion building this big, huge highway so that the city could grow. And, and so there are obviously opportunities for the city to grow and the water system, the electrical system keep pace. And we re rely on planners to make sure that that, that, that happens. Gentlemen, the red shirt. Uh, you're, I, I, it just defies logic to me how you can add those many apartments, those many office buildings, cut parking in half, and, and, and not say that we're not going to have a parking problem. Because here's what I'm trying to tell you. you know, the garage you're, you're suggesting a perfect coordination between the whole crew goes in, goes in during the day, mm -hmm. they empty out, and they all go back at night, and that just doesn't work that way. Well, can I just and, and the people who, who live in this area don't work out on 128. Can I suggest to you, the garage today is a one-dimensional garage. As I've said to you, it's kind of a static garage. That's the issue. And because it's a one-dimensional garage and a static garage, and it's only used, you know, 50% of, uh, of the garage is used every day, the garage, when completed for this project, would be a totally different garage. Totally different. It'd be half. It'd be used. Yeah, no, 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 but, but it's half. But remember, today, of the 1,100 parkers, Doug, let me just think this out with you. Of the 1,100 parkers, probably seven or 800 of those parkers are contract parkers. But, so but, 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 but that's right. You're leaving yourself with almost no room for error. No, can I make this point? Up? Just please hear me out. Right. So seven or 800 of the 1,100 parkers every day come there because they have a contract with us. Okay, So we control those people. So the, the people at Mass General Hospital or the people at, uh, uh, at um, the federal government, all those people, that contract actually is essential to the, to the operations of the garage. Without that contract, it would be very hard for us to make the garage work financially because it's actually not a very popular place for people to park. It's not close to the downtown. It's not, really, it's not, a, it's not a great place for people to park. So the contract parkers make it work. In the completed scenario, we don't need those contract parkers. We don't need the federal government anymore. Federal so government parks. Where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? So, so there, in the time since That's that garage was built, in the time since that garage was built, twelve thousand parking spaces were built all around the, all around this area. Twelve thousand. In addition to that, the federal government used to operate almost solely out of the the, uh, the JFK building. How many people work in the JFK building today? Far less today. Oh, less than we have flexi -flex and Far and less, right? The FBI is moving out to Chelsea okay. and all those different pieces. And in addition to that, the Tip O'Neill building, which was completed 12, 15 years ago, 15, 15 years ago, right? The Tip O'Neill building, that's now the center where the federal employees work. One more factor, the garage which the MBTA owned in front of the, um, the, in front of the, uh, the Boston Garden, that didn't operate on a 24-hour basis for, you know, for all of its existence. Now that's no longer owned by the MBTA. That's now owned by the Boston Garden Corporation and, and Boston Properties, right? They're going to operate it on a 24-hour basis. That's how they're going to they're going to move it. So the federal the federal employees, because they work in the Tip O'Neill building, because that garage is more convenient, they'll probably go park in that garage. They'll probably do a contract over there. In fact, those folks are trying to pitch, they're trying to steal that contract from us. Excuse today. me, but you're now creating a destination location. So people who go, they're going to want to come in and they're going to want to be able to park. Now, you have all the North End residents, you have your people overnight, mm -hmm. you have 700 new units, there's some condos, they have to have parking to go with them. Numbers point you're seven. You're creating the office, right. you're yeah. creating, I know what your numbers are, but I think you're, you're really too short because you're, you're, I think you're not thinking straight on people coming into the hotel and coming into the restaurants or whatever it is, they need a place to park. Well, could I, could I make this suggestion? I'd be happy to come back with the folks who did that parking study. Again, I'm not the parking guy, um, but the people who do that work and do this every day, I'd be happy to bring them back and have just a parking only presentation. That would be good. If you'd like that, I'd be happy to do that. Could it's, you do that with an infrastructure, uh, one for the water? And yeah, the, we could do that. So we could I'd be happy to do that. that. Hell of a good question. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. So we, I'd be happy to come back. I don't know when the next meeting is, and if you, I'm, I'm sorry, Dave, if I'm being, if you guys don't, if you have too full of an agenda at the next meeting, but I, I'd be happy to come back and, and make those people available to go through this. So it, one comment I would have too, so there is a detailed parking analysis within the, the project notification form in chapter three. There's also an attachment that goes through it, and it goes through all the components. 
And again, I think the important part from our perspective are clearly the uses that we have on site, because we're going to have new residents, no question about it. It's also very important for the city of Boston that transient users, people that come in to visit the city during the day, we can accommodate them. And there is a shift in dynamic because the office workers do leave during the day. That allows us to continue to do part our $110 rate. I'm not sure if you're in the parcel seven garage or government center garage because it is $110 rate at night, which we do provide a lot of parking for Beacon Hill, for the west end, and for the north end. Um, it's also very clear and important that this building is obviously outside the north end parking district. So no residents here, future residents, will ever have the ability to go park as a resident in the north end either. So this is outside that district, just as a, a clarification yeah, to the point. Um, so, and a lot of parking has been built, but it, we are displacing what is government workers today. There's a lot of trends happening now too with parking too. We used to have 400 government federal employees park with us. Now we're down to the low 300s. The government's cutting back. MGA basically cut 100 spaces from us over the last two or three years. So there are definitely changes in parking that are happening in the city that are just market driven. But again, the study I'd recommend you guys look at and we'll come back. We only have time for a couple more questions. Stephanie? Um, I'd like to ask something about construction impacts. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't here for most of the big day, but I, I am aware that I think there were some neighbors in especially the Endicott, North Margin mm -hmm. Street section of the neighborhood that mm -hmm. experienced structural damage from the construction impacts of the big day. Mm -hmm. Is there any potential for that to happen with this project? Well, the good news is for this project is, and this gets back to one of the advantages of phasing it, is there's no heavy digging, you know, because of the way we're building this project, really what we're doing is we're, we're dropping piles into the earth, but we're not digging huge holes, which is what the, what the big dig was all about. The big dig is... I, I'm just, I'm, 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 but, no, that's okay. But I, but as we, as we sink those piles, obviously we are responsible, you know, having engineers and all the rest of it to make sure that there is no damage to surrounding buildings. So again, you know, I'm not the guy to be the engineer on this, but we have a whole, that, that group I showed you up front, the, the team that, that would build this project is the team, same team that just came off building Freedom Tower um, in, uh, at Ground Zero in Manhattan, which includes not just Freedom Tower, but three other huge buildings in, in uh, Ground Zero in Manhattan from Tishman Construction. Uh, South, McNamara Salvia, which is an engineering firm that, that does a tremendous amount of work in engineering um, in, uh, in Boston. CBT, which has done millions of square feet of development like this. So I don't know, David, if you want to speak to that impact. Well, I think you mentioned the point very clearly. Actually, two points. Um, first is that there's no underground work here. We're not putting a cellar under. We're not putting underground utility as well. We're, we're small trenches. But nothing like the big dig. Big dig is 60, 70 feet deep huge hole in the ground and huge potential problems for things to move even just a little bit. This construction has very little underground construction. Everything is going above. Second point is, we're not going to be boom, 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 breaking the thing apart. This is, it's not going to be crumbled and crushed. It's going to be, as Tom said, very carefully deconstructed. The same way it was put together piece by piece, it'll be taken apart piece by piece and taken away. So it's really very low impact construction. The other thing I would say is uh, obviously uh, concerned about truck routes. Um, that same fact that the uh, artery ramps are right there available means that that's where the construction trucks are going to go. They'll come off the highway directly to the site. Anything that leaves the site directly onto the highway or city street. Just one more point. Um, well, I'm not going to ask a parking question except a public question. Um, in Worcester, there was a project that this reminds me of where uh, Worcester Center was demolished so that they could reconnect the city. And they, and they had to deconstruct a garage very similar to this one. Uh, although they planned for asbestos, they found much, much more than they had ever reckoned for. So my question to you guys is, what is your plan for asbestos mitigation? Do you plan to envelope the entire site? during the demolition, even if it is a, a deconstruction? Because asbestos is a big problem, but air... Uh, I think that was an interior garage. I don't think we tested for asbestos, and I don't think we have any asbestos. They did, they did too, and they found it afterwards. But we'll, so, we'll I mean, do more testing. You know, again, this is a very... In 1970, the chances that there's no asbestos in the concrete of that building is zero. Well, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll obviously do more testing on that, and, and we, we will follow the right. records. I mean, we'll fully in case... That's, that's really the, asbestos, the office space that was put up the two floors above that, I watched the building. Yes. That's, there's no asbestos there. It was put up in the 80s. That yeah. was well after the... 70s part is what I'm worried about. Well, the garage is all concrete. It's a concrete outdoor garage. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Read the new comments.